Lord, in prayer once again. Lord, just please open up our minds to your word as we consider these uh, stories familiar to many of us, Lord, but, but true, true records of your interactions with your people help us to learn what you would have us to learn from them, and we give you these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So uh, as we get started today, I just want to con- kind of consider what, what is a testimony and some different thoughts about what a testimony is. Of course, we, we've encouraged and continue encouraged to, to encourage some of you to share your testimony in the Sunday service at some point about how you came to know the Lord. So we do look forward to hearing more of that. But it's more than, it's more than just that. Sometimes we think about a... Uh, a testimony as a kind of a grisly story. It's sometimes almost like where it's like the more grisly, the better before somebody came to know the Lord. But, and, and certainly it is a kind of testimony when you share with people how you came to know the Lord or when you share with people what the Lord has done for you. And this is a, a very important thing in the Christian faith. But another aspect of the testimony and possibly the most important one is what your life shows. So sharing your testimony doesn't mean just getting in front of a group of especially other Christians, maybe even non-believers, and saying, here's how I came to know the Lord. But it is the change that Jesus brings about in your life and the way your life shines for his glory. We have many uh, fantastic testimonies as we look at the history of Christianity of people that God did incredible things to change. They were not in a good place. They came to know Jesus as Savior, and they... Their, their testimony shined when you could see the change in their lives. Uh, St. Augustine, one of the more famous teachers in Christian history, had quite a checkered past before he came to know the Lord, and people saw an incredible change in him. We know the, the, the famous uh, preacher and songwriter John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, and he had been a slave ship captain prior to coming to know the Lord, and, and really just an incredible, I mean, put in that context in history, you, you couldn't be anything that was much worse than a slave ship captain, and yet John Newton uh, came to know the Lord. A um, little more recent 20th century history, there was a, uh, a believer in New York by the name of Nicky Cruz. He was a Puerto Rican brother who was part of a, a New York Puerto Rican gang called the Mau Maus, and he came to, to Christ. There was just a very uh, gutsy evangelist in New York by the name of David Wilkerson. He shared the gospel with Nicky, and Nicky Cruz came to be an incredible evangelist for the Lord. And the reason I mention him when I think about testimony and life change is he and many of the other gang members who he was associated with when they came to know the Lord, they went to the police station and turned in all their guns and their drugs and all this stuff and gave them to the police. And one of the officers said, I'm really glad we didn't see you guys coming because we might have actually shot you before you got here to turn everything in because they, you know, walked into the police station carrying all these guns and stuff. But praise the Lord, he became an incredible evangelist. And there are just so many wonderful stories of a Christian testimony. An unfortunate reality, though, and something for us to consider very carefully as we think about our own lives and engagement with the world around us, is that sometimes a testimony can be tarnished. Sometimes a Christian testimony can be compromised. And those of us who've been in the Christian faith for very long, we all know of many situations where it could be a high-profile Christian leader, and we we, we can keep names secret to protect the guilty, but it could be high-profile Christian leaders who fall into some sort of sin, or it could just be people we know who had a strong Christian testimony, but some sin in their life, something they fell into, compromised the message they preached or the relationship they had with God. Now... It shouldn't uh, surprise us that this is not a new phenomenon. We see this even in the Old Testament, and we see it many times. One of the things we can't emphasize enough is the real hero of the biblical story is God, and God as he is manifested in Christ. We do have some sort of hero figures that are testimonies to the grace of God and the life of faith, and God used to do great things. But the Bible is so wonderful in that it doesn't give us a, uh, a pretty picture when there's not a pretty picture. It's honest about the successes and honest about the failures of, of the great men of God in the Old Testament. As we continue our study in Genesis, and we are considering Isaac... 
If you were to go back to some of our sermons on Isaac, you, you, would, you would see that he was the, the promised baby to whom the Abrahamic promise would come. And today we see the Abrahamic promise is reiterated to Isaac after Abraham had died. But we also see that Isaac did follow in the steps of some of his father's failure, and uh, it did compromise his testimony. So this gives us something to consider as we consider the Isaac story. When we look at Isaac, we see for the most part a man of faith, but like all the people in this story, other than, you know, Christ, when we get to him, we see very imperfect men and women of faith, and yet we see God carrying out his will in spite of this and, uh, and giving us an opportunity to learn what we can from the great forefathers of our faith. So with that little intro, let's take a look at Genesis 26 and verses 1 to 11. It tells us now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commandments, my decrees, my instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister because he was afraid to say she is my wife. He thought the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah because she is beautiful. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife Rebekah. So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she is really your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? Isaac answered him, well, well, well uh, you know, as I thought I might, you know, lose my life on account of her. Then Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the men might well have slept with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon all of us. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people, Anyone who harms this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Well, verse 1 clarifies an important little detail there. It says there was a famine in the land in addition to the famine in the land of the time of Abraham. That may seem like an unimportant detail to you, but when Abraham first went to Egypt, which is what God tells Isaac not to do, it was because of a famine in the land that actually led to a fairly similar story. Uh, but but um, it also is important because it shows us sometimes people look at biblical history and if they don't believe the Bible is the word of God, they like to say, well, these are just repeated stories. When we see a similar story, it's like, well, these were two different versions of the same story. And the, the text of Genesis is very clear. Not two, not two uh, different versions of a story, one with Abraham, one with Isaac, but two different stories that are similar because we see patterns sometimes learned by, uh, <laughs> by children from their parents. So this is a new famine and a new story. Abraham has passed, and Isaac is the new patriarch. And in verses 1 to 6, the Abrahamic blessing is repeated to Isaac. Just to make absolutely clear so there's no doubt in Isaac's mind. He would have heard from the moment he was born, no doubt, from as soon as he could understand the language of his parents, they would be telling him how he is the heir to the promise. Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Uh, God has given us this land. I'm sure he heard that again and again and again. I'm sure, I'm sure that was just the, uh, the chat that was going on all the time. It's kind of like you and I talking about how Jesus is going to come back someday, you know. Maybe they even had family songs they sing about it. I don't know. But, you know, could be. Um, so the Abrahamic blessing is repeated. God had told Abraham Isaac was the son of promise, but God visits Isaac to personally let him know this. 
It's very interesting to see God's command to Isaac regarding Egypt. He tells him not to go down to Egypt. And, and the reason that's interesting is because later on in Jacob's day, when Jacob is an old man, God will tell Jacob to go ahead and go down to Egypt. And we know that will lead to ultimately the, the exodus from Egypt. It allows us to see that this is all part of God's plan, but God's plan is not for Isaac to go to Egypt at this point, And God will carry these things out in his time. As the Abrahamic promise is reaffirmed to Isaac, he is told he is to stay in the land. It is the land of promise. And we understand that while God did bless Abraham and Isaac and even later Jacob in the land, they, ne they never came into the full inheritance in the land that God had promised. But they dwelt there knowing that this is the land that God would ultimately give them. Now... One of the things this passage tells us before, and we, we, we considered, we took an early look when we were going through the death of Abraham, because it was worth seeing what was the Lord's uh, final analysis of Abraham. God tells Isaac he's doing this for Abraham's sake, because Abraham did what God asked of him. We know Abraham was not perfect, but we've talked about how his, his final testimony was that he was a life of, he lived a life of faith. Uh, we are told it, it, that um, Abraham kept God's commandments, his decrees, and his instructions. So interesting because commands, decrees, and instructions, it all sounds so similar to language we'll hear later in the Law of Moses. It suggests that God gave Abraham a different set of commandments than we see in the Genesis text, that God had more communication with Abraham than is recorded. There were many commands, decrees, and instructions, and Abraham overall was a faithful man. He was, uh, again, imperfect, but he was obedient. Abraham was a man of faith, and it transitions to, to Isaac's expectation to be a man of faith, to live as Abraham lived. And of course, we understand that means uh, he was to emulate where Abraham did well and not where Abraham did not do well. But unfortunately, in the next passage, we see that he also emulated Abraham in some of the ways that were somewhat imperfect. Well, very imperfect. So, so there's an important juxtaposition between verses 1 to 6 and verses 7 to 11 here as we see uh, we see what's going on. And, and really, the juxtaposition, which just means these passages are put together, these themes are put together, and it is staggering that right after, right after an appearance from the Lord, right after God has communicated to Isaac and guaranteed he will be the son of the promise and he will fulfill all of these things, right after that we see Isaac have a lapse of faith. The same kind of lapse of faith that his father had had on at least two other occasions. And we see, as we always see, that God preserves his promises in spite of human sin, but of course... God's promises and God's preservation and God's grace makes no excuse for human sin. And what we're going to see in addition is how this affects Isaac's testimony. In the life of Abraham, in Genesis 12, 10 to 20, and in Genesis 21 to 18, we see in two different occasions Abraham had lied about his wife Sarah, saying she is my sister. Now, Abraham, it had been a truth-twisting operation. One of the things we've said a few different times in a few different sermons is how when you twist the truth, it becomes a lie. At that time, Sarah had been Abraham's half-sister. So there was a little bit of truth mixed in there. In Isaac's case, Rebekah was not his half-sister or his sister at all. So he takes the same lie, but, but there's not even the half-truth mixed in. As we read this passage, we see God, God's faithfulness, God's protection of his own promise, but we see the failure of God's chosen patriarch. Isaac lied about Rebekah being his wife, but interestingly enough, it, when, when Abraham had lied about Sarah, Sarah had been taken into the 
harem of the pharaoh at the time. This didn't actually happen with Rebekah. Nobody had actually, if, if, as it were, made a move on Rebekah. Isaac lived there for a while. You almost wonder if they suspected something else was going on. I mean, Abraham had, in, had had an interaction with earlier Philistine kings. You almost wonder whether Abimelech, the king, uh, whether he wondered if something like this was going on. If you look back at the second story of Abraham lying about Sarah being his wife, this was also in the same region Isaac is now, and it was another king. Abimelech probably is a title for the king. It probably means it means something like uh, you know, like like emperor, ruler, something like that. It probably didn't. It probably was not a proper name. So we have a new Abimelech, and you almost wonder if he's thinking, "Huh, I remember hearing about how his father, you know, had this ruse. Maybe there's something going on here." I wonder if Abimelech wondered or if something seemed wrong, because he seems to be watching for, for, for some evidence that something's going on here. Abimelech, he, he appears to be a, a sort of a shrewd guy, because it tells us that he, the NIV says he saw Rebekah caressing his wife. Um, the old King James translation actually said that, that, that Abimelech saw Isaac sporting with his wife. Um, the, the word comes from the Hebrew word for, for playing, and we don't know exactly what it means, but we know that Isaac was behaving to uh, Rebekah in a way that you really don't behave with your sister. <laughs> At least, hopefully not, right? He, he was behaving toward Rebekah in husband-like behavior, and Abimelech put this together, my goodness. That's his wife. So Abimelech confronts him. And this is a pattern we see. The same thing happens as, as, as Abraham's previous interactions. We see this unfortunate pattern of God's chosen representative. We could call Isaac here God's covenant representative. We could even call him God's kingdom representative in, in that Isaac is the, the prime representative of the kingdom of God on earth at this time. And he is rebuked by a pagan king. This is something we're, we're, we're supposed to feel a little bit like, ah, man, that, that God's covenant representative can be rebuked by a pagan king. We even see Abimelech's faith in the God of Abraham. And I'm not suggesting that Abimelech was a true believer in the God of Abraham, a, a worshiper of the God of Abraham, but we see he knows enough to be concerned. <laughs> he had enough faith in the God of Isaac, which, who was the God of Abraham, to be afraid something would go wrong if, his, if uh, someone among his people had taken Rebekah as their wife. He says, if this had happened, you would have brought guilt upon us. Why did you do this? So Abimelech's response is to command his people not to harm Isaac or Rebekah. And, and we see God protecting Isaac, looking out for Isaac when Isaac isn't behaving perfectly. We'll see that God continues to bless Isaac. Isaac will increase in wealth. One of the things that's so interesting in these encounters is because Isaac is interacting with an early kingdom of Philistines in this general area of what we could call Lower Palestine. Abraham had some interactions with Philistines. There's already a group of guys uh, called Philistines here. And in later parts of the Bible, as, as Israel interacts with Philistines, Philistines are not their buddies. I mean, I, Abraham and Isaac, all things considered, they got along okay with these Philistines. Later on, there's going to be a lot more tension, and that is a gross understatement between Israel and the Philistines. I don't want to make too much of this, and I don't want to get carried away, but you do wonder, you do wonder if a better testimony could have, could have led to slightly different history later on between Israel and the Philistines. I don't want to go to town on that, but I do know that at a couple of very important early interactions between precursors to Israel, Abraham and Isaac, who were not Israelites because they were Israel's grandfather and father respectively, but early interactions between proto-Israelites, if I can use that term, and Philistines might have, uh, might have had some connection with some later interactions. We, can, we can't prove that, but it is interesting to consider. Whatever the case, it is a sad thing in the Bible when God's people receive a legitimate rebuke from a pagan king. 
As we think about this kind of by analogy in our own day, in our own world, and we know, friends, we know we live in a world that is opposed to the Christian faith, right? We know that a lot of things are happening in the world around us that are just horrendous as the world becomes more and more, the, 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 the world of the United States where we live becomes more and more pagan in so many ways and, and turning more and more to so many pagan-like practices. In that context, our desire is to be a light to the world around us. We want to show that we've got something better because we do. There is chaos. There is a world falling apart around us. But we know that the world around us is just watching open-eyed, waiting for some form of Christian hypocrisy. Talk to a non-believer who's got a kind of a chip on their shoulder about the Christian faith, and the, the, the word hypocrisy is going to come up within five minutes. You know, well, well hey, you know, hey, brother, you know, God, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Let me tell you about the four spiritual laws or something. I don't know, you know. Hey, I've got good news and bad news. The, the bad news is about you. The good news is about God, you know. You're, you're a sinner. Jesus wants to save you. And all of a sudden... Yeah, but you Christians are hypocrites. Now, of course, we're putting that conversation a little bit in stereo, right? But oftentimes, oftentimes we have very unfair and untrue accusations. Ray and I were talking uh, yesterday about uh, early church history and a lot of the false accusations early Christians got, right? Well, you, well, you Christians are atheists because you only believe in one God, right? You guys are incestuous because you, uh, you know, because you call each other brother and sister, even if you're married, that sort of thing. And I know that was, was pretty silly, and a lot of times we get distortions of what true Christian teaching is. But the saddest thing is when there is a genuinely tarnished testimony where we... We say this, we claim faith in the God of the Bible, and we, we, we give our assent to biblical truth and biblical teaching and biblical ethics, but our lives reflect something else. It's a sad thing when any believer receives a legitimate rebuke from someone who doesn't know God. It is a sad thing when our testimony is tarnished by behavior that is not consistent with what we profess. And as we look at, at, at these aspects of the life of a great man like Isaac, it, sh it should cause us to reflect on that and reflect on our lives. Oftentimes when testimonies are tarnished, testimonies are tarnished because of fear. And a lot of us, you know, we, 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 we are afraid sometimes. We're afraid of the consequence of doing things God's way and standing strong in our testimony. But sometimes it's a question of what matters the most. What do we really believe about the nature of reality? Now that may sound like I'm going off on some kind of uh, Rene Descartes or maybe like Matrixy kind of thing, but here's what I mean about what do we really believe about the nature of reality. Do we believe that every human soul is eternal? Do we really believe that our, I don't know, 70 to 100 years here on earth is really just a, a breath of time for eternity and do we really believe that every human being is going to stand before god and and some are going to go into eternal glory and some are going to go into eternal shame and punishment do we really believe that that is the nature of reality because that is the reality that the bible puts before us and I, what I'm trying to get at when I, when, I, when I say that and when I think about this is if we really believe that is the nature of reality, then we need to pray that God will help us to understand that our testimony is always more important than our safety. If it puts us in some kind of unsafe circumstance to proclaim the name of Christ, it's something that has to be done anyway because... Eternal souls are at stake. It's one thing if lives are at stake. It's quite another if eternal souls are at stake. Talking about the idea of a testimony and, and the idea of a testimony of the world around us. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gave some teaching about that. We actually used to have some High Point t-shirts that quoted a little bit from, from this verse. 
But uh, Matthew 5, 13 and 14, fairly well-known passage. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Did anybody else used to sing that song in Sunday school about this little light of mine? I'm going to let it shine. You know, maybe we need to do a, a rendition around here. I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, it's a pretty, good, a pretty good little light. Now, we know that the person who preached that sermon, as in the Sermon on the Mount, was Jesus. An interesting thing you, you may not have realized about Jesus, you probably do know this, but it's kind of one of those uh, things Socrates talked about, recovered knowledge, because you didn't realize you knew it, is that Jesus wrote some letters. At least he dictated some letters. They were letters he dictated to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. Uh, there are seven of them given to seven churches in Asia Minor at the time, but of course having a broader audience extending even to today. And the reason I mention this is because the lamp as testimony is Jesus' illustration, and this would have been well known to all of Jesus' followers in around A.D. 90 to 95 when he's dictating the letters to the seven churches to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. And he talks, he warns the church in Ephesus, not just an individual believer, but an entire church, that they are in danger of a loss of testimony because their behavior. Maybe you never understood that in this context, but this is uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1 to 5. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles and are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, taken in the context, if we're trying to understand what he means by removal of a lampstand from its place, and we're looking at the entire Bible and what it has to say about lights and lamps, the best place to go would be the Sermon on the Mount and understand that the lamp is talking about how your light shines to the world. And Jesus was warning the church at Ephesus that if Jesus ceases to have first place in all that you do, your testimony is going to be tarnished. Sometimes believers really fall into uh, you know into a, a loss of testimony because they do worldly things. Other times believers fall into a loss of testimony because they try to do even Christian things without Christ in first place. Rules become about rules, and this is where you get these uh, you know you get these stereotypes about judgmental Christians who, who don't love people and things like that. Whatever the case, the key is keeping Christ. First, keeping him first place in our lives, keeping him as our first love. Now, I understand that God the Son, the third person of the ministry, uh, the per third person of the Trinity, had not been revealed to Isaac yet as Jesus Christ. However, as we've talked about, Isaac is waiting for a descendant who's going to overcome and break the sin curse. And Isaac understood that the God of Abraham, Yahweh God, needed first place in his life. And what we see in Genesis 26 is a failure at a certain time for Isaac to have the God of Abraham first in his life and to be, to be thinking about the, the coming deliverer who will fulfill the promise as more important than any immediate circumstances because when when you have a danger of losing your your wife who also has a share in the promise you 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 you're showing 
a willingness to put the promise in jeopardy for your own immediate safety. It was a really big deal when Abraham's trusted servant went to get Rebecca from, uh, from the land that she was in to come and be Isaac's wife. Testimony, friends. At this point, Isaac had a compromised, a tarnished testimony. Now, we are going to see that, that follow-up events in his life mean that that was not the last word any more than it was the last word in Abraham's life. Praise the Lord, he's never done with us. But that doesn't change the fact that we always need to be thinking in terms of testimony and in terms of, <coughs> pardon me, light shining. When believers live in a way that contradicts the faith we profess, it compromises our testimony. Non-believers, whatever their own issues, they are great at spotting Christian hypocrisy. False accusations are always going to be there, but let, let's, let's try to commit ourselves to there never being any true accusations. And really the fundamental core issue is remembering that God's faithfulness can be trusted even when things are hard. Lying for self-protection or something like that, that is the world's way of doing things. We can't accomplish the will of God by the world's methods. And if we look at, 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 at the, the, the failure of the church to really reach the society around us, I would suggest that if we dig deep enough, we'll find that so often the real issue is trying to accomplish the will of God by the world's methods. Sounds like a broken record because I mentioned that last week, but I'm probably going to mention it next week. Maybe not, but it will come up again. Again, passage juxtaposes God's faithfulness to his covenant promises with Isaac's lack of faith. And drawing an analogy here, if you and I are believers in Jesus Christ, we are in covenant relationship with God through the new covenant, through the blood of Christ that we celebrate every, uh, every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper. In the world we live in, we need to commit ourselves as living as those who are in covenant relationship to Christ. And this includes a lot of things, friends. It includes our speech. A, a, a friend of mine that I used to work with, he talked about one time he had, a, he had a guy come to fix his water heater. They were in his garage and they were having a conversation and this guy was, uh, you know, Throwing out, you know, swear words left and right, like he's talking like he's a, like he's a sailor or something. And then he's like, you know, all of a sudden he stops and he's like, uh, you know, ask my friend, so what do you do? And my friend is like, well, well I'm, a, uh, I'm a Christian pastor. And he's like, oh, that's so great. I'm a believer in Jesus, man. Yeah, I, I go to church at, at this church. And then he starts, you know, the conversation just totally changed. And now my friend was a, a strong believer. And this didn't, you know, this didn't rock his faith in Christ. But imagine, imagine something like that and how that might affect someone who doesn't know the Lord, who then finds out this, this man was a Bible-believing, church-going man. Um, foul language. I mean, we, we, we had sermons on Ephesians. We know, that, we know that's wrong. We also need to, we also need to always revisit the, the things we learned in Ephesians about kind speech, gentle speech, loving speech. Sometimes... sometimes when Satan is doing his work in the world and we see things turning so strongly against God and his values, it can be so easy to get a hateful attitude. It can be so easy to, 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 to just trash on people who do not know the Lord, name call and, and you know, call them out and, and forget that, wait a minute, these people are in darkness. They don't know the Lord. And, uh, we need to boldly proclaim the truth, but we can't ever forget that principle we learned in our series on Ephesians about speaking the truth in love. And that is the only way to build up God's church. Our faithfulness needs to be in action as well as speech. And there are so many things we could talk about here, but, uh, but we need to think about what we do does what we do communicate what we believe many of us are are are, are very big on our our pro-life politics we oppose you know the, the cultural practice of abortion which we absolutely should 
But, but, but one of the tragedies, one of the tragic Christian hypocrisies is that sometimes you have believers that decry this horrible, brutal practice of abortion, but they kind of ignore the biblical injunctions to care for the needy around them, to, 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 to give to the poor, to reach out to those who have less. And so they're like about, well, we're pro-life, but they're not caring about, about the lives of those God has commanded them to care about. These are some of the forms of hypocrisy that, that non-believers are really easy at picking out. We can always be like, well, yeah, but your sin is worse. If I was a non-believer, I'd be like, yeah, but aren't you supposed to be the one who, you know, has the, the Holy Spirit living in you? Aren't you supposed to be the one who's come out of darkness into light? Sort of, I sort of wish non-believers understood these things so they could, you know, say these kind of things. But, oh well. I can say them, so we'll hope that's a little bit helpful. We need to think about faithfulness to God in day-to-day -day actions. That a Christian testimony is more than just being a good citizen and obeying the law. It is about loving who God loves going to who God says to go to, and letting the love of Christ permeate everything that we do. Brothers and sisters, as we, as we analyze this, I mean, we're not gonna, we're not gonna stand here and for six hours, well, I'm standing, you're sitting, but we're not gonna stay here for six hours and talk about all the different possible dimensions to which a testimony could be tarnished by, by some form of hypocrisy. A, a preacher wants to have applications, but these applications will, 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 be so wide there's no way we could cover all of that now it's something before the lord we all need to pray about but we always need to be in reliance on the lord we need to rely on his spirit as he preserves our testimony but as we do that let, 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 let's pray that our testimony will not be tarnished when we fail, when we mess up, like Isaac, like Abraham, like Jacob, like all the others, that doesn't have to be the last word, and it doesn't mean God doesn't redeem. He always has more chances, and he's never going to stop using us. But sometimes a jeopardized testimony can have a devastating effect at a crucial time at a certain person's life. So let's really pray that the Lord will give us a strong and powerful testimony. Without judging our father Isaac who did things for the Lord who lived a life of, of great faithfulness to the Lord without having any sort of judgmental attitude about our forebears let's pray that God through his Holy Spirit will let us learn from their mistakes so that our light will will shine and people will genuinely see Christ in our lives let's pray father thank you so much for your truth thank you for your word. Thank you for Father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord. Thank you for the fact that you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sometimes we, we forget the power of those words. It tells us you are a God who does your greatest work through imperfect people of faith, Lord. All of our failures, our hypocrisies, anything else like that, we bring to the foot of the cross. We recognize that Christ did enough to reconcile us to you despite our imperfections and despite our sin but i just pray that the reality of what christ has accomplished on the cross will lead us to evermore seek your holiness your truth to, to live your love and your righteousness and your justice as we look around and as we think about the world around us and, and as we think about our, our great desire to have christ first in our lives and be a light to this world we give you all of these things in the precious name of jesus Amen.